One thing that you can't hide and you can't disguise is a genuine Christian. Genuine Christians are just genuine. And sometimes people have forgotten how to be genuine. They put on some airs or some act. They look like or dress like the way they think they're supposed to look. They kind of have this aura about them that they feel as though they're holy or something. And so they have to somehow get some kind of special feelings generated or some kind of get up and go inside their spirit that they think that they're going to be extra anointed. But the reality is you just got to be you. God doesn't want you to be anything special. He wants that uniqueness and that distinction to come from him, not from you. Because he wants to receive the glory where he wants you to be just the vessel. So really it doesn't matter what you look like, what you think or what you act like so much as it really involves who you know. And I can tell you that it's more important that you know him than it is to discover what you think you ought to be. Because a lot of times people will tell you what they think they want you to be. They'll tell you what they think you ought to be. But the person that you're really revealing is Jesus. So you need to spend time knowing him. Because once you know him, I'm looking at a bird that just landed in my hanging plant so I'm not moving too fast. And I'm watching him. It's kind of neat. It's almost as though God sends these little messages to me all the time. First it was a hummingbird, then later it was a bird. This one's a big giant blue jay. Actually he's got something else about him. He's got interesting markings, but he's huge. But the person that you know is the person you're going to show. So if you only know yourself, then you'll only show yourself. But if you know Jesus, he can't help but come out when you start talking about him or sharing about him or relating about him. Now I've got the blue jay like about five feet away, just really wanting me to feed it or something. Because he's wanting to check out my potted plants and probably looking for bread. So you can see all my plants that are potted. And so I'm trying not to move because I'd like to make friends with them. Hi guy. I know you're ignoring me. You want to check out that plant up there, don't you? That's right. Check it out. You can fly up there. I won't touch it. I hear you clucking. Too bad you can't pose for the camera. I don't think you'd let me go over there and move it, would you? <laughs> so, when God chooses to use someone, then what he does is simply inspires that person inside so that what's in there comes outside. It isn't as though they suddenly you know, sit down and they generate this wonderful long theological texting you know, of how they're able to you know, dissertate you know, the Word of God and come up with all the right conclusions and right similes, metaphors. That's a religious person. You know, their religion helped them in that way. But the Jesus that you know is, and the Jesus that you show is going to change the world. You see, that's the difference between someone that's anointed and someone that's appointed. Because sometimes people are appointed for a position. You know, and they do a good job. You know, they, they do the job. You know, they salvations happen, people get ministered to, you know, they, they go through the motions, they do their thing, and God is there. But there comes a time in your life where God anoints, and it's just like, wow, what a difference. You know, you're just not a musician, you're the musician, you know, for a certain point in time. Sometimes it's temporary. Sometimes it just comes on a person for a short period of time. Like, I know in some of the different giftings, you know, there's different administrations of the Spirit, the same Spirit. And God will use that in a different person's life at different times. I know I've worked in different offices in the church, and some of them were very perfunctory, you know, just, you know, being a guard in the parking lot, you know, during a service, or, you know, being a... Uh, minister of God, you know, and going about and picking up cigarette butts, or in reality going about and checking cars, make sure that nobody's stealing things, you know, and nobody's doing, you know, what they shouldn't be doing during a church service, you know. But when Jesus is in you, and you just let go and let God, then he lives through what you have to say. He abides in you. And that's what, while we look at Tozer, we want to stress about being a disciple, about 
when you want to be like Jesus, you have to not try to imitate him, but you have to let him live in you. There's a big difference. Anyone can act like Jesus. Actors have done that, like with Jesus of Nazareth or imitation of Christ. You know, there's a certain amount of inspiration to the imitation of Christ, even like Thomas A. Kempis writing in his book. But there's also something about the realization of someone that has Jesus in them, because it's just like, even they don't really kind of understand it all. You know, they just live it. And it's a beautiful thing to see. You know, it's a joy. And uh, people call it, you know, like being in his presence, where, you know, that's kind of silly, because wherever you are, you're in his presence, because he's in you. Now, when it comes out in a bunch of people, then they try to talk like that's in his presence. But that's just the manifestation of the Spirit of God, you know, being hovering over the water, so to speak, or hovering over the people. They feel that, you know, aspect of the Holy Spirit. And so it kind of makes it go, ooh, wow, you know. But Jesus in you, you know, the hope of glory, but Jesus in you, when he's alive through you, people see it. They'll be touched by it. They'll wonder about it, you know. They'll kind of want to know what's going on, you know, because they'll say something different about it, you know, just not the same, not the way it used to be, you know. And that's what Tozer brings out to us today, you know, wanting to be like Jesus and wanting to follow, not just in his footsteps, because anyone could follow behind and imitate him, you know, but being like him is something about inside you, you've wanted and you ache, except that you become more real than you've ever known before, more in tune with God than you've ever had that experience before and something that you want with more than your being exists meaning that even when it says the deer panted after the water so my soul I'm going to you got to want it you got to ask for it you got to need it and desire it more than your chiefest joy whether it be your love of your life your wife or your children or your heart or your mind or your soul or your loves or your first love or anything you got to want Jesus like that because then he floods you with himself. And then you're just like, hmm. <laughs> yeah, just like that. Jesus Christ, our chief joy and delight, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. 3211, Psalms. I must agree with the psalmist, even in our modern day, that the joy of the Lord is still the strength of his people. I do believe that the sad world around us is attracted to spiritual sunshine. The genuine thing, that is. Not the invented, hype them up with music, wipe them up with hard, drowning beats, work them up with repetition, but rather just that anointing that comes upon people when they're inspired by God and God is in them. Some churches train their greeters and ushers to smile showing as many teeth as possible. But I can sense that kind of display. You know when it's phony. And when I'm greeted by a man who's smiling because he's been trained to smile, I know I'm shaking the flipper of a trained seal. <laughs> or a trained dog. <laughs> it's just on parade. But when the warmth and delight and joy of the Holy Spirit are in a congregation and the folks are just spontaneously joyful and unable to hide that happy grin, <laughs> the result is a wonderful influence upon others. Conversely, the reason we have to search for so many things to cheer us up is the fact that we are not really joyful and contentedly happy in the first place within. We're always wanting more than what we got and we're not being content with what things that we have. For Paul said, I have learned we're with all to be content whether abased or whether to abound, but to their end with which he has Jesus in him to be content therein. I admit that we live in a gloomy world, and the international affairs, the nuclear rumors and threats, earthquakes, famines, floods, riots, cause people to shake their heads in despair and say, what's the use? But we are Christians. We have Jesus in us. And Christians have every right to be the happiest people in the world. 
we do not have to look to other sources, but we look to the Word of God and discover how we can know the faithful God above and draw from His resources of joy, peace, and love. That His Spirit in us causes us to rejoice in the time of sorrows or trials or tribulations. Why should the children of the king hang their heads and tote their own burdens, missing the mark about Christian victory? All this time, the Holy Spirit has been wanting to make Jesus our chief joy and delight, the reason why we live, the reason why we are the light. And I can't help but think, you know, maybe, maybe you've forgotten your way, you know, and you feel down today, you know, like I do. I feel very sick, you know, my, my guts are sore, I feel kind of nausea, you know, kind of, uh, but when I talk about Jesus, you know, then I just light up, I just feel better, you know, I just kind of like, well, Lord, you know, <laughs> you and me, and let's leave the body behind, you know, and, uh, Maybe if that's what you try to do, maybe try to tell someone about Jesus, about what he is with you, so that you'll be joyful. Now, of course, don't fake it, because if you don't have anything to tell people about Jesus, maybe you need to live a little longer and experience Jesus a little more. So, study to show thyself approved, obviously, and go to church and develop your good graces, but learn to have some experiences with God because he's real and if you don't have a real experience you don't have anything really to give because until you've lived it you really can't give it